Good morning, Docs and Shirts. I love that sound, um, but I'm gonna break in here for just a, just a little bit. Hey. Well, my name is uh, Rudy Hartman. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, uh, I get to be on staff here with Doxa, working with our, our college students. Um, I want to thank so many of you who let me know that you were praying for us as we gathered on Thursday. I um, was really, really grateful for that. would ask you to continue praying, as, as Jared said. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2 this morning. If you have a Bible, you can head over to that. Um, so I work with college students, which means a decent part of my job is figuring out how to ask good questions. <laughs> um, and, and anytime I hear like a really good question, I actually just love like just honoring when I, when I get to hear a, a good one. So at Connection Group on Monday, uh, Erica laid out this really great question where she asked us like, what do you do with your days? Which I thought was an excellent question. Um, on Friday night, like a couple Fridays ago, uh, a few of us were out celebrating our friend's birthday and John uh, kind of pulled back and he asked this really excellent question. And he said, what's something that you're passionate about outside of church? To which I said, is there anything? I'm kidding. Um, but I, I <laughs> no, but I, I, I thought it was a really, really excellent question. The following Sunday afternoon, last Sunday, I actually kind of just took that question another step down uh, as I was kind of thinking through it, even, even past that moment. And the question that came to my mind was this, like, how would you, and just do this with me for a little bit, how would you describe something that you are passionate about to someone who has no concept or context or familiarity with that thing at all? Like something that you're, you're like really, really passionate about, like how would you start to talk to people about that thing if they have no clue about, about what it's about at all? So like for, for me, I don't talk about this a lot, um, because there's a lot of baggage with it, but I played tennis at like a really competitive level for a number of years. And so if I was to talk with someone about something I was really passionate about, and I was to talk with them about tennis and start to try to explain tennis to them, I would say, okay, so there's like, the, uh, the concrete is green. I guess that's a thing. Um, and there's these white lines. Don't worry about what the lines are. It's not super important right now. But there's these boundaries, and it's this neon uh, ball, but it's, it's a felt ball. And, and there's a stick, but it's got a kind of oval at the end of it, like 95 square inches with strings on it. And you manipulate the ball with the strings to try to beat the other person. Person. Uh, the scoring is confusing, so don't worry about it. Like, that's, like, like I, I would start to get into that about, like, okay, this is kind of how, how what tennis looks like. Um, and then maybe someone would ask me, what was it like to play tennis? Um, and I would describe it as the most isolating, lonely, mental, and physically intense thing that you could do, where you have no one to blame or rely on but yourself. All right, that's a little sad boy on Sunday morning. Um, but... But every time tennis is played, everyone loses except one person, and your desire is to not be that one person. Um, that, that would be like how I would describe tennis to someone. Like I said, there's some stuff behind there. Uh, what's interesting about that thought experiment is that when you start to describe something to someone who has no concept of it, you actually are parsing out what you value the most about that thing. You're identifying what engineers call the irreducible minimum, what that thing is. If I'm going to describe it, I have to describe at least this. You get granular. You determine what you value, what you feel, not just what it is, but in some ways what it really means to you. So let's, let's take that same question, the same exercise, and apply it to church. If you were to meet someone who had no concept of the church, what it is, what it's like, how would you describe it to them? Maybe you'd say church and they'd say, oh, I drive past churches all the time. And you'd say, oh, well, that's, that's a building. A church isn't really a building. And they'd say, well, if it isn't a building, well, what is it? So you, you start to get a little bit granular. Well, it's a gathering of people. Well, there's a lot of gatherings of people. Well, it's a gathering of people that care about what Jesus cares about. Oh, well, that's not super. It's a gathering of people who care about what Jesus cares about and seek to live sacrificial and selfless lives for the sake of others just like Jesus did. You see what happened? Like you start to actually parse out what you value, what the, the thing is. You get more granular, more detailed. What is it? Like, what is it really? In our teaching series, we're moving through these six marks of discipleship. The first two, looking up, worshiper and becomer, 
Last week, we talked about our first mark that looks in, the church in relation to the church, Christian in relation to Christian, the idea of lover. And last week, Rob talked about how our relationships in with one another in the family of God are to be marked by love. And today, we're going to get a little bit more specific about what love looks like in action inside of God's church. And what that requires, what love on display within the context of the church requires is something that is seen all throughout the book of Acts where we are this morning. Hope that was enough time to to get to Acts too. But our love lived out will mean that we are our fourth mark investors. That we're investors. We are understandably invested in that which we love, which we are passionate about. This is how Luke shamelessly describes the people that made up the early church in the book of Acts. Now, just a little bit of context. Luke wrote both the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, kind of a two-part commissioned report to a man named Theophilus about the life of Jesus and the life of the early church. And over and over, as Luke identifies how Jesus describes his followers, and as Luke identifies the nature of the members of the church, this inescapable descriptor of these women and men rise to the top. They are investors. Maybe another way to say it is like this. Note takers, this is for you. An investor is someone who gives of themselves for others like Jesus did. An investor is someone who gives of themselves for others like Jesus did. There's this incredible nod towards the importance of invested men and women in the church in the very first verse of Acts chapter 1, verse 1, where Luke writes, he says, I wrote in the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. That's the gospel of Luke. It's what Jesus began to do and teach. And if that's where it began, then the very first verse of the book of Acts is actually begging this question. How did what Jesus do and teach continue? That's where it began. How did it continue? Well, it continued through men and women who had trusted in Jesus for salvation and in response to what Christ had done for them, or the Spirit of God in them, and they were invested. They gave of themselves for others like Jesus did. That's Acts 1. And in Acts 2, this is this first teaching of the early church from Peter, which is an incredible, just this first sermon talking about who Christ is and what he's done. At the end of that, thousands of people are baptized and put their trust in, in Jesus. But at the end of Acts 2, there's this sort of postscript. There's this, this moment that pops up, and they pop up all over the book of Acts. It's a really fascinating short book to read within the library of Scripture. But here, here in Acts 2, Luke pulls us out of the scene of Peter preaching and opens the door to what the rest of the book of Acts is going to be about and center around, the church of Jesus, the community of faith. It's almost as if he's writing to give us the irreducible minimum in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And it gives us a picture of this invested church. This text is the hinge upon which the front door of the book of Acts swings wide open as we get into the text. So, so look at Acts chapter 2, verses, just verses 42 and 43. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to the prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. So just on the front end of this, I want to note how the description of this church, of this invested group of women and men, men and women, starts. It starts with these practices. These are the things that the church was devoted to, that they gave themselves over to, that they were invested in. They would constantly and consistently gather to do these four things together. And what's interesting is that each of these devoted practices reveals something about the identity of the church, the identity of disciples, which we've actually seen along the way through this series. Some of these words will sound familiar. First, they're devoted to the teaching. They're devoted to being becomers as they hear the apostles' teaching. It only makes sense that the apostles, by the way, would gather Christians to teach because it's exactly what Jesus told them to do in Matthew chapter 28. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. It's interesting, while in Acts chapter 2, the word disciple doesn't show up in these verses at all, its shadow is all over this text. If you're taught to observe what Jesus commanded, you become a learner, which is the direct definition of the word translated disciple. Disciple is a learner, and as such, the church gathered to learn. But it was not a learning that was simply for more information. It was a learning that was intended to be embodied, 
to learn and relearn this new way of Jesus, this new way of life as they followed after Jesus. In fact, what follows from that would have been some of the very things that they learned from the, the apostles' teaching. So the next practice is that they were devoted to the fellowship. They were investors. Fellowship, um, there's a christian word that we've got to put a little bit of meat on. Um, Fellowship can sometimes feel like a Christian colloquial for like hanging out. (laughs) We're fellowshipping. You're hanging out. Comparing fellowshipping to hanging out as a one-to-one is like comparing a great white shark to a goldfish. If you encounter a great white shark, that encounter will change you forever as you encounter something that is incredibly powerful. If you encounter a goldfish, that actually just fits in a bowl in your home and stays alive if you manage to sprinkle some flakes on it every so often. They are not the same. There's a word that's used here in the original language that's incredibly important, um, koinonia. You may know it uh, from it being like the last word in the national spelling bee a few years ago. Or if you're familiar with modern church history, uh, it was a word that was very popular through uh, the recent Jesus movement. But this word means something along the lines of a self-giving community or a sharing community. It's rooted in the idea of, of the Greek word for common. This idea of participating in the lives of one another in a self-giving way. To put it simply, they were invested in one another in a self-giving way. We'll get to that idea a little more soon. The third practice was that they were devoted to the breaking of bread together. So they're becomers with the teaching, they're investors with the fellowship, and they are lovers through the breaking of bread. This was life lived around the table, the intimacy of a shared meal. It was the place to weep with those who were weeping and to rejoice with those who were rejoicing. To build relationship and to build one another up. The table was where the groundwork of a relationship where you could specifically love one another was built over time. And as they'd gather, they'd often remember the Lord's Supper together. They'd take communion together, gathering together at the meals to remember the Christ who had brought them into community together together. Their bond of investment in one another was not political, ethnic, cultural, socioeconomic, or even purely geographical. Their bond was the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ for their sin. That's what brought them together. Their meals made no sense without the gospel. And the fourth practice is that they were devoted to the prayers. They were worshipers. So maybe your translation, actually, if you look at it, says uh, that they were devoted to prayer Uh, The the translation there is actually the prayers. This was a cultural practice. It is a plural set of prayers for the morning, midday, and evening prayers of the Shema and a cycle through the Psalms in Jewish culture. These new followers of the way of Jesus were primarily Jewish in their culture. So they kept that practice and would actually start to incorporate prayers of Jesus that they had been taught by the disciples or that some of them had heard Jesus himself pray. It was an intensely communal practice. They would gather regularly at the morning, noon, and evening times to pray together. So often, um, and wrongly, I, I, I believe, we assume that prayer is only spontaneous and only individual, and I think that has more to do with the individualistic nature of the West than Scripture. I, I think we need spontaneous prayer, but I also think this beautiful picture of structured prayer in community together uh, to be brought back to form us into the way of Jesus would be a beautiful thing. All right, Um, teaching, fellowship, breaking bread, and prayers. These are the practices of the church. They would gather together for these four things as they follow Jesus in that place together. Now, from the jump here, we get a picture of what the church does. However, Acts 2 does not end at verse 43. It continues. And here's what's interesting. As it continues, uh, Luke does not give more detail to the teaching of the apostles, although this would have likely been some of what they taught. He does not give more detail to how to break bread together, although that is mentioned, it is a necessary part of what's coming. He does not sit there and say, this is how you pray the prayers together, although that would have been essential to what's going on here. What's described by Luke in the verses that follow is how the fellowship of the church can be invested in one another. How they can be investors, communal investors, giving of themselves for others like Jesus did. So these next three verses unpack what the invested fellowship of the church actually looks like. I'm going to put a Surgeon General's warning on the front of what's coming up because this is going to press you. It should press you. It has certainly pressed me this week. We're going to walk through uh, seeing this in three questions. One, 
What does it mean that they gave of themselves? Two, what were the obstacles of doing so for others? And three, how is Jesus their model? So verse 44, all the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in the homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So question one, What does it mean that they gave of themselves at all? It's unavoidable in this text, right? Like if you just look at it, like they were givers. They gave of themselves for one another. Verse 44, together they held everything in common. Hapas koinos. Now if koinos sounds familiar, it's because we've already given you a different Greek word that is similar to it, that it's actually rooted in koinonia. It's this common fellowship, this common giving of one another, sharing of yourself with one another. Fellowship here means holding everything in common with one another in your community. It means to be giving of yourself. This text refers uses to let this idea go. It's in the practices of fellowship. It's in the character to hold it in common. It's in the description of what they do as they gave to anyone as they had need. Luke is emphasizing the importance of giving to themselves because it is crucial and irreducible as it relates to being a Christian in community that they would be investors. And I think they did that in at least three very practical ways. Now I'm going to talk about these practical ways because it's really easy for us to get in here and in spaces like this and sing songs like, God, in my life, be lifted high on Sunday. But in these three things, I don't know if you're going to be lifted high in them on Tuesday. So we're going to get really granular and really practical by seeing how they invested in one another. Hopefully it will shape the way that we do the same. So the first thing that they gave to one another was their time. Think back to the practices. Teaching, fellowship, break bread, prayers, all of those cost one thing, minutes in your day. All of those cost the most non-renewable resource that you possess, that they possess, which is time. They gave of their time to meet, meet with and be with one another. Check down to verse 46. It says they were in the temple and in their homes so regularly. Every day they continued to get, gather together. No one could keep them apart. They were meeting together, being together, spending time together. Have you ever just thought about that phrase that we use, spending time? It is the literal spending of time, self-giving investment of time into being with somebody else. There's nothing that could keep them away from each other. Now, no one made them do this. There was no compulsion to this. In their mind, it was just the next logical step. Time was worth it because it was the cost of knowing one another. How could they pray for one another if they didn't know one another? How could they love one another in specific ways if they didn't know one another? How could they meet one another's needs if they didn't know one another? Time was worth it to spend on each other because it was the cost of knowing one another. So they gave of their time. They also gave of their talent. Look at verse 44. I love that it doesn't just say they were together and they had all their money in common. It doesn't say they were together and they had all their tools in common. It doesn't say they were together and had all their livestock in common. It says they were together and they had everything in common. Everything. All of themselves in common with the people who were around them. And within that everything was the unique gifts and talents that each of those individuals had when they came together in community. So I just, I just want you to go back in your mind, if you could just picture this, however it looks like. Maybe you picture um, like the temple, whatever it looks like for you, or a crammed household. Just one of the gatherings of this church near Middle East, first century. Go there with me for a second. Just picture the gathering of the church in either of those places. Like I wonder if you can see the creatives that made art and wrote poetry and wrote songs or or tunes for psalms to help the eyes of the gathered people be lifted up to worship Jesus. They brought that gift. Can you see the hospitable men and women who loved having a crammed house and home, who loved to make food for large crowds as the church gathered in smaller groups throughout the city? Can you see the administrators and the organizationally oriented who were able to gather information from thousands of people who were following Jesus, literally thousands, and connect the needs with the people who were able to, to meet them within that community? Can you see the, the, those skilled in the ministry of mercy knowing how to leverage the networks? 
of people within these communities to meet the needs in the city? Can you see the single men and women who are without the distraction of family or spouse and were invaluably devoted to one another, to the word and to the work of God? Can you see those who practiced encouragement and strengthening words given to one another to build up the body, bringing words of strength, encouragement, and consolation to one another? Can you see those who were excellent in business, able to fund out of their excess the mission and movement of the church? Can you see the Titus 2 women investing in the younger women and the elder men investing in the younger men to build them up, encourage them, confront them, rebuke them at times, disciple them, and strengthen them? Can you see them giving everything within themselves to one another within that? Can you see how their talents were held in common for the sake of each other? Can you see a community where they invested their talents into one another and where others invested their talents into them? See, Paul outlines this in 1 Corinthians 12 when he's talking about the spiritual gifts of the church. And I love how John Frame describes spiritual gifts. He says, it is any divinely given ability that edifies the church. That should be considered a spiritual gift. Bringing anything that you have been given by God that strengthens the people who are around you, that is a part of the everything that you bring and that you can invest with within the community that you're in. That's what the, these individuals in their invested fellowship did. And no one shamed them for it. No one forced them into it. It was just the next logical step. Giving of their talent was worth it because it was the cost of building one another up. So it was their time, it was their talent, and then their treasure. Third, they gave their treasure. Let me say this bluntly. Someone paid for the bread that they broke and the meals that they ate and the chairs that they sat in when they gathered in those homes. Just like someone paid for that at your connection group. When the needs came up, you know what happened? Someone would sell property or would reach into what they had, whether they had excess, whether they had much, or whether they had little. They reached in to meet that need. Someone supported the apostles so they could devote their time to prayer and the teaching and the movement of the church. People gave of their treasure, invested of their treasure, and giving of their treasure was worth it because it was the cost of gathering and meeting needs within the community. But it was also an act of worship. Imagine the apostles teaching the people and reciting via the oral tradition the words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount where Christ himself said in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Where Jesus points this out when the, the widow who had very little brings her two copper coins that make a penny and he said, she's put in more than anyone else. Everyone else gave out of their abundance, but she gave out of her little. What she gave was more, but because what she gave was an act of worship. C.S. Lewis talks of treasure when he says, if your charities do not at all pinch or hamper you, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because of our charitable expenditure excludes them. These are investors. They gave of themselves, of their time, of their talent, of their treasure, and they did not simply do that for themselves, but for the sake of others. Which brings us to question two. What are the obstacles of giving of ourselves for the sake of others? Y'all, this is where the rubber meets the road for an investor. I wanna be, I really wanna be as gentle as I can as I get into these, because the last thing that I would want to do and that would make any sense for me to do would be to shame you into something or make you feel awful for doing what you can do. I am as aware as anyone that there are seasons and stretches of life where it feels like life simply happens to us. So with that caveat in mind, there are also obstacles to giving of ourselves and giving of our time, our talent, and our treasures that we either tolerate or sometimes have a tendency to feed that will always create a gap between us and being investors. See, it's great to give of yourself when it's convenient or when you feel confident or when you have abundance. But what about when you don't? Or frankly, what about when you do but you just don't want to? Does our love for others motivate a giving of ourselves to invest in them? See, time, talent, and treasure all have their own obstacles. For time, it's the obstacle of convenience, convenience. Often, the convenience equation goes something like this. I would love to so long as. I'd love to gather every Sunday so long as it's convenient. I would love to come to Connection Group every week so long as it's convenient. I'd love to get together to pray so long as it's convenient. The easiest way to sum this up is in a system of ordering, one of two choices. One, are you ordering your fellowship around your schedule? Or two, 
Are you ordering your schedule around your fellowship? If we order our fellowship, our investment in one another around our schedule, then it will always feel in- inconvenient for us to spend time getting to know and be in relationship and community and fellowship with one another. And that sense of inconvenience will rob us of the joy of getting to invest in one another because it is next to impossible to invest or be invested in a place where you simply are not. It's the first obstacle of convenience. For talent, it's the obstacle of comparison. I, um, I experienced this pretty intensely throughout college and to be honest with you, still experience this uh, today. Comparison looks like Um, looks at the talent or the gift that you have for building up one another within the context of the church, for the strengthening of the community, for the investment that you can make. It looks at your gift and and you say, someone else can do it better. So I just won't. I have a word of encouragement, but that person over there does it better, so I won't give it. I would like to host, but that person over there does it better, so I won't offer it. I'd like to pray, but they pray so much better, so I won't pray. The comparative obstacle is rooted in a performative culture that we frankly just breathe in day after day. I have to be the best or it doesn't matter at all. So please, let me just speak so clearly to you. If this is you, let me just, I need your gift. We need your gift. Your connection group needs your gift. Comparison cannot have any place within the context of community. I have great news for you. We're not performing for one another, and we're certainly not performing for Jesus. But we are practicing so that we can continue to grow in the gifts that he has given us. And you can, you can practice here. It might not look pretty. It might not be perfect. But you can certainly practice. You can practice encouraging. You can practice hosting. You can practice whatever it might be. And you know what's going to happen over time? You'll start to actually believe as you practice your gift over time that God has actually given you that gift gift to give from yourself for the sake of others. You will break into the freedom of being an investor and out of the chains of comparison. Now that's one side of comparison, but the other side of comparison is actually thinking that you're the only one that's gifted. Thinking of yourself as better than those who are around you. Maybe you are more skilled, but perhaps the gift that you need to give from your talent and from your gifting is raising up more people to be skilled in their gift as well. Not to compare yourself to them and feel cocky, but to celebrate the work of God in the lives of men and women around you and help them grow confident in the gift that God has given them for the sake of others, to build them up, to raise them up in their gifts. Convenience, comparison, and then for treasure, it's the obstacle of consumption. I've always been blown away at the way that Jesus talked about money. He talked about it a lot, more than faith or prayer combined. He seems to care a lot about finances. You ever thought about why that might be? I think he cares a lot about finances because of the truth that our money tells about us. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus uses money as a metric to reveal our true priorities. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus sets the love of money, which rightly understood is not simply a love of the tool, but a love of the things that money can get you, a selfish greed that can be exposed by having money. He sets that out as a false god. He breaks down the reality that our worship is often revealed in what we do with our money. That the god money often invites us to worship is really ourselves as we indulge in our own comfort and our own pleasures. This is one of the most difficult things, I believe, about following Jesus in the West right now. The consumption equation often goes like this. If I don't, then I'm not. If I don't have something, an experience, a possession, a title, whatever, then I'm not my ultimate self as defined by the spirit of the culture or the zeitgeist of our age. It attaches consumption to identity. It's a difficult thing to unravel because it is in the air that we breathe. Everything in most marketing that is commodifying your attention is doing the work of identity definition, and it's running this consumption equation. It commodifies your political leanings, your preferences, and your perception of yourself, all of it to drive you to a place where you cannot help but consume so that you might finally become. And it's one of the most devastating lies and brutal deceptions that's destroying the fabric of culture and the fellowship of the church. It says the person that I need to invest in the most is me. Consumption as a leading ethic in the way that we approach our money actually robs us of the joy of contributing, investing in the people that are around us. These are the obstacles. These are the dangers 
that will keep us from being investors, from the joy of investing in one another deeply in koinonia and fellowship, the self-giving, sharing community, convenience, comparison, and consumption. How do we overcome them? I don't want those. I know you don't either. How do we overcome those obstacles? I want to give you two words. Christ and confession. Remember our phrase, investors give of themselves for others like Jesus did. This is the like Jesus did portion. How was Jesus their model for giving of themselves to others? Let me say it like this. There is no point in the Gospels where Jesus is not giving of himself for others. These obstacles begin to fade away when your picture of Christ becomes clearer and stronger than the trappings and the promises, the false promises of convenience, comparison, and consumption. If Jesus is not better than what these obstacles offer, then these obstacles will always remain. Christ's giving of himself was both sacrificial and selfless. There's even this incredible moment when he teaches his disciples this exact principle. Mere hours before he would be betrayed and crucified when he washes their feet. He washes their feet and then he says, as I have done this for you, now you go and do it for others. Now this is incredible because you'd think if you're a disciple that Jesus is actually going to say, what I have done for you, now you go and do it for me. But he doesn't say that. He says, what you've seen in me, go and do for others. As you've seen me give of myself for others, you go and give of yourself for others as well. This goes all the way to the cross of Jesus Christ, where he gives his life for the sake of anyone who would trust in him for salvation. He is sacrificed and crucified for the sin of the world. He gives everything for the sake of others. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us giving of himself for others. He doesn't just die, he rises again, giving us assurance that we who trust in him for the forgiveness of sin can trust in him for the assurance of everlasting life as well. We will one day live as he now does. Christ resurrected for the hope of the world. Jesus is constantly giving of himself for others. So the next logical step for us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, what just makes sense is for us to do the same to be devoted to the teaching, the fellowship, the meals, the prayers, to hold all things in common, to meet the needs of each other, to be together and invest our time, talent, and treasures in one another. And when, when, when in community, they and when we fall short, when we deny others in our community due to convenience and comparison and consumption or anything else, then we get to remind one another of the gospel of Jesus Christ that not only forgives, but strengthens and enables you to continue to get back up again and continue to give of yourself in that beautiful community. To give of yourself for others like Jesus did. Because of those words, like Jesus did. Christ, which then leads us to confession. See, confession is a gift from God that leads to freedom. James 5.16 says to confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Often, when we think of confession, we may think of confessing blatant sin or deliberate sin, the things that we know are sinful, are obvious sin. I think that for us to move towards being investors and overcoming these obstacles that keep us from investing, we may need additional categories to get at this sin that often lies beneath the surface. We need to get at the internal orientations that we have because of the culture that we have lived in and grown into, the trust structures that we've developed that are in disordered relation to Scripture and the Spirit of God and yet somehow also feel so natural, like picking up fig leaves to cover yourself because of the shame of your nakedness just so you can pretend you're no longer naked. We need to learn how to sit with God and hold a question before Him in prayer and in silence and then just wait. David teaches us how to pray like this in Psalm 139 when he says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there's any offensive way in me. Lead me in the everlasting way. Maybe this week you need to just set a timer on your phone for a couple of minutes and pray that question. God, what are the offensive ways in me as it relates to being an investor? Are there any ways I'm elevating convenience, comparison, and consumption over being invested in the people that are around me? And just sit with that question, put the timer on your phone, and wait. Wait on God. Maybe some thoughts will come to mind. Maybe scripture will come to mind. Maybe there will clearly be something you need to do or change or start or stop. Write it down. Talk with your connection group about it. Perhaps you'll need to confess it to God and to the community. Christ in confession. 
as you see Jesus and you see your own need for him, he'll lead you to the places of change where you'll be able to experience the joy of being an investor, the joy of giving of yourself for others as Jesus did. Now to close, um, there's one phrase in Acts 2 that we actually haven't addressed yet. If you look at verse 47, every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. I don't think that it's a mistake that after describing the fellowship of the community that Luke says, and every day God was adding to their number. It's almost as if one led to the other. It's almost as if Jesus was actually continuing what he was doing and teaching through the invested men and women in the local church. That as they lived like Jesus and spoke of Jesus, people saw Jesus and were being saved by Jesus. That God was adding to their number daily as that community was continuing to love and invest in one another. I think there's one woman that we brilliantly see this take place in, and her name is Lydia. In Acts 16, we meet a woman named Lydia by the river outside of the city of Philippi. We don't have a ton of facts about her, but we know she was a dealer in purple cloth and most likely incredibly wealthy. Paul goes to the river to pray because there's no synagogue in that city, allegedly, and he ends up speaking about Jesus in that place of prayer. The Lord opens Lydia's heart to what's being said. She receives Christ as Lord and Savior, is baptized and along with her household and then is urged, she urges and persuades Paul to stay in her housing compound. She says, don't go on to the next place. Stay with me here in Philippi. And so Paul and the people that he'd begun to start gathering the church of Philippi head to Lydia's house until Paul and Silas are eventually arrested. I don't have time to tell you that story, but you should read it in Acts 16. Paul basically talks a jailer out of committing suicide, and that jailer and his entire family decide to follow Jesus. Paul and Silas are released from prison, and that's basically the end of the story, except it's not. That gets you to verse 39, but the last verse of Acts chapter 16 is verse 40. This is incredible. After leaving the jail, they came to Lydia's house where they saw and encouraged the brothers and sisters and then departed. (laughs) They came to Lydia's house. They went to Lydia's house because they knew if we're going to find the brothers and sisters in Christ gathered somewhere in this city, it's going to be at Lydia's. Lydia, who had been a follower of Jesus for just a short while, was already an investor. She was investing time to house the people because it was the cost of knowing one another. She was investing her talents to host the people because it was the cost of building one another up, which is uniquely helpful when your leaders are being arrested for the message that you all have believed in and are building this local church around. She's paying for all of this and investing out of her treasure because she'd heard that Christ, Jesus, had given all of himself for her so why would she not give generously for others she is invested and she continued to be paul and silas leave where's the church at philippi it's at lydia's house scholar by the name of witherington concludes lydia's story by saying this in the new christian community she played a prominent role as the mother of the church in her home providing not only hospitality but a center for christian growth and gospel dissemination that's an investor that's lydia giving of all that she had for the sake of others like Jesus did. The result, a church is planted and grows. Disciples are made. God saves sinners as the gospel is disseminated through the city and goes from house to house and throughout the city and throughout the region. That's what God did through Lydia as an investor. In her life, Christ indeed was lifted high. Now, this is what happened as they loved and invested in one another. But what would happen when that love and investment breaks out and they move towards their neighbors with this love? When they move towards their neighbors with this investment? What if this practice of love and investment internally is actually what sets up for love and investment externally? We're going to talk about that over the next two weeks. But this is what Jesus has done through Lydia. What, what could he do through you? Having much or little is not really what matters here. Giving of yourself for Jesus, giving of yourself for others, sorry, as Jesus did, is what counts. So what could God do through you as an investor? What if you just take a moment to close your eyes and bow your heads where you are for just a moment to respond? I'm not going to ask you to do much of anything other than sit there and pray and consider, consider two things. One, if you're here and you're a Christian, 
I wonder if you just hold that question out before God. God, what is my next step for being an investor? God, where is it in my time, in my talent, in my treasure? What, what is it? Where can I give of myself for others, Jesus, like you did? And what obstacles in the way? Maybe you just need to sit with him for a moment in that. And, but if you're here and you're not a Christian, I want to thank you for being here. It's an honor to get to open the word of God with you. I want you to consider what Jesus has given. Not what you need to give, not what you could do, but what Jesus has done. That God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that anyone who would believe in him might not perish but have everlasting life. God has given you Jesus and Jesus gave his life on a cross so that you might not have to pay for your sin because he already has. He's taken, uh, he will take your sin from you. He'll give his new life to you. It, It will be for you as if he got up on the cross in your place to take the punishment that you and I deserve for our sin. Take that down into the grave and then resurrected three days later so that we might not share in his new life. So perhaps for you, if you're here and you're not a Christian, you need to just consider what Christ has done that for you, he's died, he's given. You can come home to him today. You could put your trust in Jesus today. You could believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and become a Christian today. So however you need to respond, take a few moments to do so. And we'll sing here in a minute.